Welcome back to the newsroom. It's the worst violence the West African nation of Guinea has seen since Captain Musa Dadis Kamara seized power in a bloodless coup in December of 2008. According to the Guinean Human Rights Organization, at least 157 people were killed Monday and more than 1,250 injured when troops opened fire on tens of thousands of protesters demonstrating against the possibility of Captain Kamara standing in elections next year. Now, there's been widespread international condemnation of the crackdown. The United Nations Human Rights Chief has called on Guinea's military rulers to allow a full inquiry into the bloody crackdown while former colonial power France has suspended its military ties with Guinea and says it's also reviewing bilateral aid. Well, here to give us an insight on the situation in this West African nation is Africa specialist Douglas Yates, who has just returned from Conakry. And Franz Van Katz of Virginie House will also be joining us live from the Guinean capital in just a few minutes. Douglas, good to have you with us once again. Let me start with you. Um, you've just returned from uh, Guinea once again. And you know, my question first is, was this bloodbath something to be expected? Uh, no. In fact, when I went, it was to help prepare the youth to engage in what were going to be democratic elections in December. But already by August, there were indications that those elections were going to be postponed and that Captain Dottis, despite his promise, was going to present himself for elections. The menace at the time was that people were going to take to the streets and that they were going to overthrow the regime. It wasn't predicted that the military was going to fire on the protesters. Now, when he seized power in December of 2008, Eight, uh, Musa Dadis Kamara was virtually unknown. He was a virtually unknown army captain. Uh, his popularity grew as he promised genuine democracy in Guinea, including a safe transition period and then presidential elections, as you just said, in which he would not stand. But his rule has been increasingly characterized by eccentric displays of power, dashing hopes of real change in Guinea. Yukaroya takes a look at Musa Dadis Kamara's profile. December 2008, the funeral procession of President Lansana Conte, Guinea's long-serving leader, was quickly followed by a bloodless military coup. Within hours of the dictator's death, a group of army officers announced that they had taken over power. The man who spoke on the radio was virtually unknown at the time, a certain Captain Musa Dadis Kamara, chief of the army's fuel supply unit. According to some local media, he had been chosen the coup leader by a draw. The next day, he declared himself president. I am the president of the National Council for Democracy and Development. We have no intention whatsoever to stay in power forever. After 18 months, we shall hold free and transparent elections. At first, expectations were high among the public for the young military officer who promised to wipe out corruption and drug trafficking from the country. Kamara took a hands-on approach. He arrested a number of former high-ranking government officials, among them Musa Conte, the late president's son, seen here wearing a pink polo shirt. He was accused of drug trafficking. The new junta leader made his crackdown on high-profile figures very public. A confession by the country's former interior minister became a televised event, as well as other mock trials. Over the next few months, Kamara's leadership and behavior became increasingly erratic, and his taste for power became insatiable. He had said he would not run for presidency if an election were held, but by August this year, he seemed to have changed his mind. If I want to be a candidate, I will. The strongman insisted he didn't control the army, after troops killed close to 160 protesters in Monday's brutal crackdown. All right. Douglas Yates is with us on the set tonight to talk about Guinea and the crisis there. Uh, Douglas, Dadis Kamara has said he's in power because of God. How popular is he? In well, Guinea. Well, he has a kind of negative popularity. First of all, the old regime, the ruling party, was very corrupt. The people were extremely dissatisfied. The, all of the social indicators are low. And there's always, with a military transition, the promise of order, of rule of law. His popularity among certain ethnic groups, particularly the Fulani, who are the largest group, is fairly high because the previous president, Lansana Conte, had persecuted them. Hmm. Uh, and so he he, there are factions of the society who support someone who's a strong candidate. The absence of an alternative is his major strength. So he's warned that uh, 
you know, after Monday's events, Dadis has warned that uh, the army could mount a fresh coup if he were to step down. But he's also said at the same time that he's not in control uh, of this army, in full control of the army. It's, it's, and this is certainly very concerning. Do you think his, it's true that he's not in control or is, or is he just simply trying to, to shift the blame away from him? No, it's true. The weakness of a military regime is not that the people will rise up and overthrow it, but it's factions within the officer corps who will replace the current leader with themselves. He didn't even leave the capital during an entire year because if he leaves the capital, he risks that another officer will replace him. Mm. All right. Joining us also from Conakry, the Guinean capital, is France Vincas Virginie Ayres. Virginie, thanks for being with us. Captain Kamara, it seems, has been uh, trying to make amends since Monday's violence, since Monday is cracked down and has proposed the formation of a national unity government to ease the political crisis. What's been the reaction of the opposition to this uh, proposal? Well, uh, for the moment, uh, fully, the, the opposition refused this proposal. And uh, we met one of its leaders this afternoon who said that it's absolutely not an issue and said, uh, I quote, on what basis could we do this uh, government uh, after this uh, such a massacre? Um, the opposition's priority now is to have justice and to have an investigation on the massacre of uh, September 28. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other side, uh, uh, some observers of the Guinean political life underline that the refusal of the opposition uh, is not, has not been formalized in a, an official declaration and that uh, you can imagine that in some times and under, under special conditions, some leaders of the opposition might accept to participate to a unity um, unity government right. and everybody tonight is going to follow uh, the junta's in, uh, the chief uh, junta uh, the junta chief uh, on tv who is going proper maybe to uh, give more details about his proposal now tomorrow virginie friday october 2nd marks guinea's 51st uh, anniversary of independence which has been traditionally a day of celebration but i imagine that after monday's events it's likely to be different this year are, are there fears of more violence in conakry tomorrow well, there are some fears, but you have to imagine that here in the capital, uh, the atmosphere is closer to mourning than to uh, violence or uh, to a demonstration. On the one side, uh, you have the junta who is going to cancel its traditional uh, défilé militaire and is going to uh, pay tribute to the victims of uh, September 28. On the other side, the opposition has not called for demonstrations, street demonstrations. But you cannot exclude that uh, in some uh, suburbs, uh, some people might spontaneously uh, go on the street and protest. And this evening already, a lot of Guineans received per SMS an invitation to wear red color tomorrow, uh, tomorrow to, show the, to show the protest uh, against the power here. Thank you very much, Virginie Yertz in Conakry, for updating us on the situation there. Douglas Yates, last question to you. Does the international community have any leverage at all in this crisis? Yes, it does. Uh, the United States government, particularly the ambassador, Kent Brokenridge, has been sending strong messages to the regime. The French government has threatened to cut off aid. Uh, the only hope that he could have if he lost those Western partners would be China, who does have an interest in the bauxite and the iron reserves. But China's been sending messages after the last G20 meeting that it's willing to start negotiating some of its positions and support good governance. So it's not clear that China would be willing to throw him a rope either. All right. Thank you very much for your insight, Douglas. It's good to have you with us once again. That's the focus on France Vencat tonight. More news coming up very shortly, but right now let's take a look at the global weather picture. Report to you by Royal Air Morocco.